Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Our 1.30 session is with Jamie Holmes, Reference and Instruction Library, librarian at Tulsa Community College, and she's going to do an OER 101 overview. So thank you for joining us, Jamie, and please um, let's get started. Thank you. All right. Very good. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And I think 25 minutes to give an overview of OER is, is still a little bit um, ridiculous. And those of you who know me know um, I like words and I say a lot of them. And so I have tried very, very hard to keep this um, to just the, just the facts, ma'am. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Could I just have one audible letting me know that you're seeing my OER 101, a very brief overview slide. We see it. Very good. Thank you. Um, so really quick story here. Um, the very next slide and many um, to follow do not follow the same theme. And that's because I, I started my slide deck probably, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago or so. Um, I procrastinated long enough and went ahead and got started. And then, as many of you know, we had open ed week last week. And so the big four day open ed conference, and there were so many awesome ideas and new information and great presenters and great slide decks. I, I sort of blew the whole thing up and started over. And, um, but I did like my original first slide, so I kept it. <laughs> so that's what you get. Um, so this slide deck is actually an example of an open resource that I, um, created for this. And as I go through it, I'm going to be connecting it to the, the things that I'm talking to you about with regard to OER. So um, this, um, hang on one second, why is that not moving? Sorry. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this presentation is a modified version of uh, Cheryl Casey's Getting Started with OER. Um, it includes some of my own original material as well as a lot of content borrowed from other openly licensed materials. This particular slide deck is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0, except where otherwise noted, and the screenshots are pursuant to fair use. What you're looking at is a fairly common example of how we um, comply with the use uh, proper use of open educational resources um, by providing that um, that statement of attribution um, where the, the content came from get, giving credit where credit is due essentially. So as I said, 25 minutes can't really even define OER um, and, and all the different pieces of it in 25 minutes. So I had to stick to four guiding questions. Um, what is it? Why should we bother? Where are they and how do I start? And so that's how uh, we'll frame the next um, 20 minutes or so that we have together. Um, first, to clear up some confusion, because I know when we, we hear these terms open, OER, OA, um, open access, it, it can be a little bit confusing of, of what's what. So um, a good way to think of it is when you see open access, it's primarily talking about research. When you see open education, um, including OER, it's primarily talking about teaching. So, so we do different things with open access materials than we do with, with teaching for the most part. Um, open access and open ed both stress the importance of equity, both stress the importance of the fact that um, information and knowledge um, shouldn't be something that is only for the, the privileged and those who can afford it. Um, so, so really these things are intertwined, but I feel like at the beginning, it sort of helps to, to separate out. When we're talking about open journals and our scholarly publishing that a lot of our faculty are doing um, in, in open journals that are not behind a paywall, um, that's open access. And that's not really what we're talking about here um, when we talk about open education or open educational resources. So let's define them. Um, UNESCO probably has um, the most common definition out there. Open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. Um, so it's important to, to note, you know, they are materials that are used for teaching, learning, and research. They, they don't have to be online, although most of the time they are, but they can be print. Um, OER can, can be print, 
um, uh, and, and exist in the, the physical world as well. Um, and OER itself includes not just textbooks. I mean, that's when I think about it, um, I think about open textbooks primarily, but the slide deck is OER. Um, a video can be OER. Um, even entire courses have been built, um, test banks, uh, you know, test question banks um, can also be OER. It's a wide variety of, of options. Anything that can be used for teaching and learning, basically. Um, said differently, and this is, I'm sharing this because in our OE, OER 101 course, this is what we use, the Creative Commons definition. Slightly different words, but the same heart behind it. Um, and that's what's important to remember. So the key here is understanding what is open and what isn't open. And the, the bottom line is um, we want to quell misconceptions. Um, I used to think that anything that you could get to for free online was an OER. Now, I, I'm a librarian, so I knew that library content was not OER, but I thought that, um, you know, that article um, that the New York Times put posted on their website or, um, you know, some somebody popped a PDF up on their university website and, and it was actually a PDF made of, a, of an article. That's not OER. Just because it's free doesn't mean that it's OER. Um, the, the trick is to remember these five R's, um, retaining, reusing, revising, remixing, and redistributing. And the, the keys for me, the big keys with OER are that idea of retaining and redistributing. Because when you retain something, you know, you, you can go to a library website and do your research and download an article, and I've got it in my hard drive on my computer. I am retaining that. I'm storing that. But the key there is that that's for my personal use. The copyright violation, which is what we're trying to avoid here, is if I were to then post that PDF article in my, in my class, or, or even worse, post it on a LibGuide or post it online, um, I am... I'm essentially stealing from the copyright owner the ability to have that item and share it as you wish um, or not. Um, when people take things offline um, and, it's, and the link goes to a dead page, that's, that's what happens because that's their right to remove that access or, or, or move it online so it has a, a different address, it has a different URL. Um, the key there is that the copyright holder, the person who whose idea originally went into a tangible form. And of course that's, I don't wanna get into a copyright lesson here, but um, copyright basically is any, any idea that is in a tangible form, doesn't have to be registered with the copyright office to, to be copyrighted. Um, and so if I don't put some kind of a, a disclaimer or an open license on my material, it is assumed that I want to retain those rights. Now, if you want to make a, a photocopy of my article and share it out with your students, you always have the option to ask me as the copyright holder, is it okay if I make copies of this for my class? Um, but what, what open and um, the openly li open licenses that we use, what those do is those give that permission beforehand so that nobody has to, to turn around and ask. Um, the three in the middle, I think, are also very important with regard to OER, um, but those typically we all know. You, you um, Well, reusing, I suppose you could reuse uh, something in a class and in a, in a club meeting. Um, but in terms of like using the con content differently, um, changing it in some way, um, and then combining as I did with this slide deck. Um, an example of a reuse, I guess, is, is also the slide deck. Um, there was a, an infographic a couple of slides back this year. This, um, I screenshotted that from Shannon's, um, and of course it's not gonna open in the right window, sorry. Um, this right here is a PDF that she created and shared out during open ed last week. Um, and it, uh, I just basically copied this part to, to use as a, an image in my slide deck. Um, and that would be an example of reusing. Questions about that before I go on? And I have trouble when I'm screen sharing seeing everybody. So if you do have a question, um, please do uh, somehow give me an audible if you can. I'm watching the chat for you. 
Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate that. Um, all right. So, so basically, again, uh, OER um, is based on these these five R's, along with the fact that that they are free. There sometimes will be a cost incurred um, if if somebody wants uh, like a printed copy of an OpenStax textbook or an, a printed copy of something. Obviously, there are costs involved there with paper and ink and, and uh, human labor. Uh, and so sometimes there will be a small fee, um, but the content itself is free and that's the key to that. So how all this is done um, is, is not always, but very often use, uh, using Creative Commons licenses. So uh, modeled after the all rights reserved copyright symbol that you see there on the left, um, the Creative Commons is the smaller CC some rights reserved. Um, it's important to note that there are um, 20 years of use behind these, oops, sorry, behind these um, licenses. Um, 2002 is when they first were um, debuted and, and marketed and shared. They're used worldwide, um, recognized uh, in, in several countries. Um, and Creative Commons basically means some rights are reserved. I'm the copyright holder and I'm releasing this out to you um, and you're allowed to do certain things with this material. Um, and I can, I can set those um, with the specific CC license that I use. And um, look at those now. Um, the little person in the circle is the attribution and that's, that's pretty much the base um, you'll pretty much always see CC by, I can't imagine seeing CC without by. Um, so you want attribution. There is an exception um, that I'll get to in a minute. Um, the little money sign with the bar through it is a non-commercial attribution. And what that means is you can use it, give me credit, and please don't make any money on it. Um, it it's intended to be forever as it goes um, to, to not be profitable. Um, the idea being, of course, that um, equity, we shouldn't have to have money to, to have this information. The SA um, is the backwards C with the arrow pointing down, and that means share alike. And what that means is if, if Cheryl, for example, had an SA on her license, on her slide deck, any of the material that I use from that, I would not be able to put a different license on it. Basically, it says, I'm releasing this material with this license. You can use it, but you need to, to follow and adhere to what I set as far as the use permissions. And then the ND, um, that is no derivatives. And what that means is you, you can use it, but you cannot make any changes to it. I want it used exactly as it appears. Um, the Examples that I've heard of most for that is um, material created by indigenous populations, and they want to make sure that the um, uh, the quality of those remains uh, remains accurate. Um, so that sometimes is, is something that you'll see um, on those types of pub publications. Are there any questions before I show you the next slide? Because that's where it gets a little bit trickier. Okay. All right. So. These licenses typically are used in concert with one another. So you noticed at the beginning of my slideshow, it said CC BY. So that is just a, you can use it, just give me credit for what you use, and, um, and there, there really are no other restrictions. Um, moving over to the right, where you see the CC BY and C, that is attribution, but you can't make any money. If you go below that, the CC by NCSA means you can use it, give me credit, please don't make a profit on it, and none, no downstream remixes, meaning any other uses of this material also have to carry that same license. And ultimately, of course, that is so that there's no profit made um, on, on the resource. Um, moving back over to the left, the CC by SA um, is, is basically restricting anybody using the material downstream from placing a more restrictive license on it. So I'm releasing it out there, give me credit. I don't care how you use it. You can even make money on it. And I also don't want you preventing anybody else from making money on it downstream if they use um, the material in a remix. Um, over on uh, below that is um, a, a more restrictive license, which is 
Um, you can use this material. You can, you can make a photocopy of it and share it out for free. Just give me credit. Um, you can- um, Alexa, stop. Uh, sorry, my phone thought I was talking to her. Um, uh, you can, um, uh, you just can't make any changes to it. And then over on the right-hand side is the CC by MCND. And that of course is um, you can't change it and you can't make any money on it. Um, now you'll notice you don't see an ND with an SA. Can anybody think of why that might be? In order to have a new product that you would potentially change the license, you would have had to revise the material. So there's no such thing as a CC by NDSA because if you're not making something new with it, you are not needing to relicense it. So there's no need to, to have that limitation. Okay, hope that that wasn't too uh, um, complex to, to talk about, but I think it's important. All right, any questions about this before we, one more thing I wanna talk about with regard to um, license. There's also the public domain. Um, a lot of material is, as we know, in the public domain after a certain amount of time. Um, and this is even more flexible. Um, there really is no attribution needed. Um, it's, it's already in the public domain. It's free of copyright. There are no restrictions on use. Um, it's, it is like a good idea to attribute, but it's not, um, it's not required by the uh, public domain license. And um, as we know, I mean, the copyright, is, is a little bit complicated, has to do with the, the um, death of the author, et cetera. But um, generally anything before um, 1926, I think is the, um, is the date, um, it's in the public domain. Um, let's see here, what else would I wanna talk about? Oh, you can actually choose to put something in the public domain before it's time, if you will. Um, and that's that um, the circle with the zero inside of it, um, the absolute zero, um, that allows, me as a creator to put something out there and, and waive all rights. I'm just putting it out there for the good. Um, and I don't really care if you credit me or if you um, sell it or, or whatever. So that's wide open. Um, one quick thing. Um, Amy. Yes. There's one question in the chat that pertains to that last slide. Difference between these. The, um, the difference as far as I am as far as I'm aware, and to be clear, I'm no copyright expert. Um, the difference here is the, um, the um, public domain, the, the um, Creative Commons Zero license is, is a choice, whereas the public domain, the traditional public domain is a, is a time. Um, it, it, it only happens after a certain amount of time and it's an automatic. Nobody has to make that choice. It just after a certain amount of time, it becomes public domain. Does that help? Yeah. And again, I'm not a copyright expert there. And this is, I don't, we can't go too deeply into this because we, we don't have time. <laughs> um, I'm going to make sure I don't want, I haven't missed anything. Um, CC zero is what that's called. Um, and there's a note here that um, Cheryl shared in 2020, the Smithsonian announced it had released 2.8 million images and data into the public domain using CCO. Um, so, and that that happened because the, the amount of time had not gone by yet. So the Smithsonian chose to do that. And it was a, um, an action, a specific action that they took. All right, um, we, all, we always get questions about like if I'm remixing this and I find all this open stuff, but there's this one thing that I want to use um, and it's not openly licensed, are there options for me to use it? Um, and there, there was um, at American University, um, they did a um, code of best practices. And so it's a pretty extensive tool that you can go to. I'll share this slide deck um, at the very end, you guys, so that you'll have all these links. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go out there because we're at 10 to, um, but um, that resource is really dense. And so if you are just starting out 
um, I would recommend that you don't worry yourself too much with, with all of this, with the licensing and the fair use and all that. Those are the kinds of things that um, your OER support person, whether you have one at your campus or, or one of us here in the coal and OCO sphere, um, we can help you navigate some of those uh, questions. And I also will say something awesome I learned last week. It's okay to say it depends when somebody asks you a question um, because it truly does depend on, on a, lot of, um, a lot of factors with OER. Um, all right, let's get to the next, why bother? <laughs> um, this is the big one, why bother? We all know this, we all know that costs are out of control. There's tons of research out there showing textbook costs and, and whatnot. Um, we are all here to um, educate students whether they are wealthy or not. Um, we all know that, that high costs are a big reason why students drop out. Um, we we want to retain our students if we can. And so that, that for me is, is probably the biggest reason. That's the reason why I, um, why I got into this um, several years back. Um, but there are other reasons too. And I had thought about taking a minute to, to go out to a Jamboard and getting your why. Um, unfortunately, though, I'm, we, may, we may do that um, after, um, but I want to make sure that I cover all of my content. So um, just quickly, some really good reasons to do, uh, to incorporate OER into your courses without or, or support those efforts at your campus, um, even disregarding the whole money, the money deal. Um, being able to customize a resource, you know, we've all had that that textbook or that handout or that whatever that is just not quite what we want, and so we use it, but we use it with a disclaimer. Um, with uh, OER, everything's customizable, uh, unless it has an ND, of course. That that's an exception to this, but um, you can you can change. You don't like that image. You don't like that chart. You don't. You think that paragraph is is outdated. Um, you know, we all know in in certain disciplines. Things are changing every day, and so it's it's tricky to take a textbook that was published by Pearson, you know, a year ago or more, um, and and have that be as up to date as we want it. So OER um, gives us that ability. Um, day one access, you know, we've always had um, situations where our something forgets to get ordered through the bookstore or a student is trying to find a lower cost copy. And so they do the Amazon or the third party seller um, and they're waiting three weeks for their book. With OER, typically day one access is, is built in. Um, social justice and equity, again, the wealthy students should not have access to better and more resources than, than their counterparts. Um, Open licenses and open pedagogy foster sharing and collaboration, which is, is good for everyone. Um, with OER, you can incorporate DEI um, concepts as well. Um, if the textbook isn't reflecting your students, you know, they're they're looking every day at, at people who don't look like them, that that can um, that can cause um, you know issues with confidence and whatnot. So bringing in more diversity. Um, different kinds of um, learners, um, bringing those elements into our textbooks is important, or all of our materials, really. See, I, I default to textbooks all the time, but of course, it's all materials. Um, uh, the ability to innovate. Um, a lot of universities now are, are um, considering OER creation for um, tenure and promotion, um, being able to be um, a little bit more creative with how you design activities for your students. Um, OER allows for that. Um, academic freedom, it's the ultimate academic freedom. Uh, professors typically, obviously you have your course objectives and your course outcomes, but you teach with the examples that the publisher gives you. Um, whereas if you're, if you're looking at a variety and pulling in what works for you from multiple sources, that's going to be the best product um, that you can put together for your students, and that's a benefit. Um, and then finally, student success. Um, I don't have any to cite offhand, um, but a growing number of studies are showing um, that students who use OER are not performing worse um, than their, their counterparts using $120 textbooks. Um, the, the quality is there, um, and it's, it's, even, it's getting better and better. So where are they? They're there. <laughs> um, they, there is no, not one big repository, unfortunately. So there's a number of different places to search. Um, one of my favorites is the Open Textbook Library. I like this one because it does have um, a system of reviews in place. 
um, and those are, are getting more and more robust each day. Um, this one I love, it's near and dear to my heart because of course we have press books here in Oklahoma now. Um, when I'm searching for material to, to present to a faculty member to perhaps um, adopt or adapt, um, I like to show them the press books directory because if they find something in there that they like a lot of, we can clone it into our Pressbooks network and then it's a whole lot easier to edit. Um, but I do wanna make sure you know that you can adapt any um, OER from any platform. It does not have to just be um, a Pressbooks book um, if you wanna pull it into our Pressbooks network. And then of course the, the near and dear to everybody's heart because uh, it's probably been around um, the longest, at least in an organized um, high quality format is the OpenStax textbooks. And they're getting better and better with their ancillary materials. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on that, but there are um, they have a, a landing site where you can connect with partners and get free and low cost um, ancillaries for your students. So homework help and test, test question banks and that kind of thing. And of course we have our good old uh, Google. Um, there is a way if you go into advanced search in Google where you there's a usage rights filter where you can um, uh, filter using um, the, they don't call it CC, but this is the um, label they put on it, free to use, share, modify, even commercially. So you can actually search Google as well for materials of all kinds. And I was gonna ask, I was gonna stop and ask if anybody here had a favorite site. And if so, pop it in the chat so that your um, colleagues can, can gain that benefit. We're gonna move on. There's a lot of help out there, tons and tons of, of guides and um, uh, toolkits and um, books that can be um, used as you are not only creating materials to help bring your colleagues on board with OER, but also um, that you can use to, um, to plan presentations, to, to educate yourself, um, and to get programs that your, your institution started. Um, there's a free OER starter kit that's out there. Um, and this one I should put in the chat. Let's see. I'll throw all those in the chat after guys. I'm having a hard time grabbing the links from my notes. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so where can you start um, here in Oklahoma? So I recommend that you um, that you start by reaching out and um, connecting with the people that are here. Um, we have, um, oh, um, there you are, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I lost my slideshow. We can still see it. Okay, good. I lost my, I lost it on my end though. And then I, I wasn't sure where. So our OCO, um, and that's one of the organizations putting this on, um, we have a collaborations um, tab here on our uh, OCO website. And if you scroll down this page, you can see all of the different institutions that are members. Um, so that's one place that you can start. Um, there are many um, libguides or library created guides here uh, from those of us in Oklahoma. So um, all of these institutions as of about a week ago had an OER guide on them. There are two really, well, there are tons of toolkits, but I found two last week that are my new go-tos now. Um, this one here is from, um, a Canadian university, yeah, College Libraries Ontario, their learning portal OER to toolkit. I love how it's organized. Um, I actually will throw that link in the chat right now so that you have that one to walk away with because I think that's gonna be a good one for you. And then um, Cheryl, who shared out the, um, the slide deck here, she has a, a whole slew of resources on a toolkit um, that she shared as well. But the reason we wanted you guys to come today, throw that in the chat to you, is because we have a course that you can not only take and get more in depth on all of this, but you can earn $50 while you do it. And that is our OER 101 course. I'll put that in just a second. Um, before I do that, though, I want to make sure you know 
You don't have to learn it all in a day. You don't have to learn it all in a semester. You don't have to learn it all in a year. Um, I haven't. I've been I've been doing OER stuff since I don't know 2015, and I, and I still learn every day. And and you heard me for the last 25 minutes. I still sort of stumble over my words when I explain it because there's just so much, um, and and it can get complex. And sometimes the answer is it depends, and that can be a little bit messy. So start small. Um, replace just one chapter, one chapter that you hate in your textbook. Go find an OER that that does the same thing better and, and introduce that. Um, maybe adopt a supplemental resource that fits nicely with the learning outcomes that you have. Um, and by all means, hit the um, OK Learning Portal and sign up for um, the Open Educational Resources Basics and Beyond um, digital course. And without further ado, I'm at two o'clock. So if there are questions, Thanks so much, Jamie. Thank we gotta you, go. Fantastic. If you have questions, please email me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the share and say, thanks for coming guys. See you in the next one. <laughs>